On the 24th of February, Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered his troops to invade Ukraine. The European Union, as well as its member states, reacted swiftly and adopted a wide range of sanctions, targeting the Russian government, financial institutions, state-owned companies, as well as President Putin and his inner circle. In the government statement on the 27th of February, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz spoke about a turning point in history while announcing military and financial aid to Ukraine and extra funding for German armed forces. These are major shifts in German and European foreign and defense policies. In this short series, views on Russia's attack on Ukraine, we see how countries around the world are reacting to this war in Europe. My name is Janne Leino, and I work at the Konrad Adenauer Foundation's Multinational Development Policy Dialogue in Brussels. For today's discussion, I am delighted to greet Konrad Adenauer Foundation's country director from Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, Mr. Viktor Frank. Viktor, thanks for joining us. Thank you uh, for inviting me. Victor, um, I spoke a little bit about the reactions in, in, in Europe and uh, in NATO countries as well as European Union countries. How has Mongolia reacted to this crisis? Well, uh, given the fact that the Mongolia uh, lies uh, between Russia and uh, China, which supports actually Russia in, in this conflict, uh, there, there is more or less one way to, to react for Mongolia. And you could describe the Mongolian official response like a harsh but some kind of understandable pragmatism. Uh, the reaction was that they took several days to formulate actually an official, official response, which was in the end limited uh, to some kind of empty phrases and uh, they abstained uh, from the UN vote, uh, but it was the official reaction. The uh, mood and the reaction in the public is a, a little bit more different uh, and it is quite divided in the public. What, why is it so divided? I mean, Europe has reacted very strongly with sanctions, building up military forces, uh, strengthening the, the eastern flank of, of NATO. Why is Mongolia so ambiguous? Yeah, well, you have to understand that uh, Mongolia has a strong uh, historic ties and connections to Russia. Uh, the, the Russians are often referred to as elder brothers, if you speak to Mongolian. So if they say our elder brothers, it's about Russia. So for especially for the older generation who grew up with Soviet troops in the country, uh, who grew up with uh, Russian thought in the schools, which is actually uh, still the, the case, they are more on the Russian side and show some kind of understanding for Russia's reaction uh, to their so-called tweet from the night from the NATO, uh, but the younger generation, uh, which actually partly uh, was uh, visiting uh, universities or schools in the western part of, of the world, they react with more understanding to, to the Ukrainian side. And if you see uh, the the history of Mongolia, uh, there's still a huge gratitude uh, for for Russia or for the former Soviet Union and Russia as the, the, the state which come out of this uh, for helping gain some kind of the international recognition and uh, of course for defending its independence from Japan in uh, 1939. So it's quite present. You mentioned uh, Mongolia is a landlocked country between China and, and Russia. A big topic in Europe, uh, specifically in Germany, is energy security um, as uh, Europe is so to some part uh, largely dependent on Russian um, energy exports or European imports in this case. How does this affect Mongolia? You mentioned already that China has taken a relatively positive uh, stance towards Russia's aggression in Ukraine. Yeah, actually the effect is this Mongolian neutrality, which is actually one of the pillars of their foreign policy now for about uh, almost 30 years. Dependency on Russian uh, energy sources, you could call it huge. While in the energy sector producing electricity, it's coal and Mongolia has, I think, the biggest or one of the biggest sources uh, or resource, resources or, uh, uh, regards of coal. But uh, if you look on the uh, oil, on, especially oil products, which are imported from Russia, it's about 98%. So uh, nevertheless, um, they are depending on Russia in this product, on these products uh, or on gasoline and diesel. Uh, they are still trying to become more independent and uh, Mongolia has its own sources, uh, oil sources, 
and uh, is building now a refinery to, to create its own uh, gasoline, its own diesel, but it will become operable by the end of the next year. So in the meanwhile, they are quite dependent on Russia in this field. And uh, on the same side, uh, they are very dependent on China because about 88% of countries uh, exports from the mining sector, which is the main sector here in the country, goes directly to China. Uh, Mo Mongolia is also one of the lighthouses in, in the region when we talk about democracy and, and people participation, and um, other one being, for example, the Kyrgyz Republic. Um, this status or this development has also led uh, to the fact that uh, it's it's a major um, development aid receiver. A lot of organizations like the Konrad Anna Foundation are um, in Ulaanbaatar, in Mongolia, to help the so uh, civic society to develop further. How do you see the conflict having an effect on, on European and Mongolian cooperation? Well, as I said, uh, of course, the Mongolia stayed pragmatic and neutral in, in regards of, of this uh, arise or yeah, of, of the conflict in Ukraine, and uh, they are still meeting with, with the official Russian and Belarusian side, uh, even after the war started, uh, there, there was a sign of, uh, of an agreement to build a pipeline from Russia to, to China uh, on February 28th, so like four days after the war already started. Uh, but nevertheless, even though they are pragmatic in the foreign policy, they are is still in democracy in, in the country. And uh, democracy and a free and open market economy uh, have been a cornerstone of the new Mongolian identity now for about 30 years. And this is still the, the one of the, of the cornerstones. So I think uh, that the engagement uh, with Europe is uh, those not only a pragmatic approach to, to gain more foreign and trade uh, support uh, from, from Europe, but also based on shared democratic values. But if you look to foreign policy, sometimes you, well, how to say it, at best you, you should realize if, if you can afford to, to have a value-based foreign policy or not. And in, in Mongolia's case, it's quite difficult to do so. So therefore, I should be, we should foster the ties with Mongolia even stronger and support the country. Because EU sanctions on Russia has an, uh, also an effect on Mongolia. The land routes uh, between the EU and Mongolia is now closed uh, to the sanctions and to the effect that there is hardly, uh, I mean, no, no train connection to Europe uh, anymore, so to say, at least uh, for, for, the, for the moment. And uh, the Mongolian uh, airlines uh, who, or which travel to, to Europe have now to take a different route, which is four hours longer. So they can't use Russian airspace for, for this anymore. So they are directly affected by the sanctions, by the EU sanctions on Russia. And we should think about uh, how to support Mongolia in this case, because the Mongolian Chinese border is already closed since October last year due to, the, uh, to, the, uh, it's to, to China's uh, zero COVID policy. You mentioned zero COVID policy. It's difficult to do trade between China and Mongolia. The sanctions will bite the Russian side. Do the Mongolians have any specific wishes in this new situation, what the European Union should and could do uh, to help Mongolian, um, to help the Mongolian civic society, but also in terms of trade? Any specific wishes which have been raised? Well, the specific wish would be that uh, before uh, imposed sanctions on Russia or before even starting or when starting working on them, uh, there should have been consult, uh, consulting measures with, with Mon the Mongolian side. So uh, you should speak about it, uh, what could be the, the outcomes uh, on the Mongolian side, what uh, could be the disadvantages and uh, beforehand to, to think about how to avoid them if it's possible and if not, how to, uh, well, uh, maybe to find another way uh, to support Mongolia. The specific wish is, of course, to support Mongolia's economy. They, they are still uh, rely on European goods. Uh, most of the apples here in Mongolia are coming from Poland and uh, some, some other fruits and vegetables and uh, so like in the food sector but also the, the Mongolian fabrics uh, have to, to rely on European parts and the tr transportation is quite difficult. So maybe we should think about 
something like support their airlines or even support maybe one European airline to fly directly to Mongolia because the flight connection now between Mongolia and Europe, uh, it's only the Mongolian airline Niat and Turkish Airlines. Dear listeners, um, you have just been listening to a CAS MBPD podcast, the views on Russia's attack on Ukraine with uh, Viktor Frank, CAS country representative from Mongolia. Please follow our social media channels for further updates on this series, as well as on our other products. Thank you and goodbye.